Thank you. This is Shobha welcoming everyone to this very special webinar in the lead up to this year's World Heart Day, which is observed on 29th September. Our governments have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as they are more commonly known as at last year's UN General Assembly, one of which is to reduce premature mortality due to non-communicable diseases by one-third by 2030. Cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death globally, causing an estimated 17.5 million deaths in 2012, which represents 31% of all global deaths. Despite such a mountainous death and disease toll, public health response to save lives seems to be falling short. Today our panel of experts will share more on how we can save lives from heart diseases. But before that, let me make a few quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait till the end. Just type your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen. We will take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that we have enough time left for question and answers. Thank you all for your cooperation. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsaru, a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. He has 42 years of rich experience in journalism. Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter, Ila Gandhi, and CNS had conferred the Health Justice Lifetime Achievement Award upon Ashok Ramsaru in Durban in July 2016. Congratulations, Ashok, once again. Over to you now. Thank you very much, Shobaji. Warm greetings from Durban, South Africa. South Africa is a country of stark contrast, middle income with high health expenditure, but alarming levels of non growth diseases and low life expectancy. NCDs including cardiovascular diseases are estimated to account for 43% of total adult deaths in South Africa. Not just tobacco use is alarming in our country, but so is obesity. 70% of women and what, a third of men are overweight. But good news is that government's response is becoming better in fighting diseases and improving collaborative responses, although formidable challenges remain. Now, let me introduce the panel of experts, Rachel Shaw of World Heart Federation. World Heart Federation is the official organizer of World Heart Days. Following thereafter will be Professor Rishi Sethi, Department of Cardiology, King George's Medical University, KGMU. He is also the organizing secretary of 11 National Conference of Indian Society of Cardiology 2016 and National Convener of STEMI, Subspeciality Council of Cardiology, Cardio, Cardiological Society of India. And there, and finally, um, Alice Granger Gasser, Program Development Manager, World Heart Federation and a noted long-standing tobacco control expert too. Today's webinar becomes more special because two of the three panelists have been featured before. Professor Rishi Sethi have been on webinar panel on heart disease and tobacco control related topics as well as Rachel Shaw of World Heart Federation was on the webinar at last year's World Heart Day too. Well, let me welcome Rachel Shaw from World Heart Federation, and without any further delay, let us hear from her why this year's World Heart Day is so very important. Well, it's over to Rachel Shaw now to present her special case. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for welcoming me to the world webinar. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, World Heart Day 2015 was a huge success. Um, I'm just trying to show you my screen. Apologies. One second. 
I will we go. Sorry about this, everyone's going to be seeing. There we go. Hopefully you can see the, see the screen. So World Heart Day 2015 was a huge success and we have participants in 123 countries and an estimated total um, media reach of around 500 million. World Heart Day has continued to grow since we launched it, but for 2016 we want to see a real step change with a high impact marketing and communications campaign, increased engagement of our members, other organizations, supporters and individuals. The aim is to dramatically elevate World Heart Day and add huge volume to our campaigning and advocacy voice on national, regional and global stages. So with this in mind, September the 29th this year is a starting point for a two-year campaign. The central theme for this World Heart Day campaign is the power of information. It's the power of information to transform individual heart health and global and national heart health. So the pub, for the general public, our aim is to empower individuals with information to live heart healthy lives. We've launched our campaign website uh, at www.worldheartday.org and that includes access to campaign materials like this poster you're seeing now, a toolkit and our Heart IQ quiz. It's a simple test which features eight questions and that tests individuals' knowledge about heart health. Now this year, in addition to our consumer campaign, which we've always focused on the general public for World Heart Day, we're, we're taking a slightly different tack and we're also issuing a global policy call for governments to ensure effective monitoring and surveillance of cardiovascular disease to provide quality of care of CVD patients, strengthen health systems and support the delivery of the WHO goal of 25, 25 by 25. This policy call is going to be launched this Thursday in New York at the launch of the World Health Organization Global Hearts Package and we'll be issuing a press release about that on Thursday. We'll also be having on our, on our website um, a one-pager about the policy call and um, a letter for people to send to um, governments asking for improved surveillance and monitoring of CBD. To support the Global Policy Call, we've also developed two things. One is the CVD World Monitor. You can see a screen grab for it up in front of you now. This is a data visualization tool looking at 150 plus countries, which helps us to track progress against the WHO um, Global um, the Gap Framework targets and therefore the 25 by 25 goal. For launch of this tool, we will be having six of the WHO GAP targets available on this tool uh, and they all use WHO data. Over time, because we intend this tool to live and breathe, we will be adding additional health indicators to provide a richer picture of global CBD. Also supporting uh, the policy call is a policy brief um, and this looks at how countries and regions collect data on cardiovascular disease with a focus on premature mortality caused by CVD. The executive summary for this policy brief will be available also on the 22nd of September on our website. And just to conclude, um, hopefully you're all going to support World Heart Day this year and here are just a few of the ways we're asking people to get involved. Take the Heart IQ test, download our materials, support us on social media using our hashtags which are World Heart Day and Power Your Life. And of course, this year, as you'll remember from last year, we're asking everyone to send healthy heart selfies to us. And that's it from me. Thank you, Rachel. Sure, this is a perfect stage to now invite well decorated and senior luminary cardiologist, Professor Rishi Serti, from the prestigious Department of Cardiology at King George's Medical University, or KGMU. He is also the organizing secretary of the 11th National Conference of Indian Society of Cardiology 2016, which will open right after this year's World Heart Day. Professor Serti is a national convener of STEMI, which is the latest subspecialty council of Cardiological Society of India. Okay. Professor Serti, welcome again. And over to you. Let's listen in now. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, is the screen visible? Yes. Clear. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm supposed to speak on the disease burden of cardiovascular disease and prevention uh, strategies for various risk factors to prevent cardiovascular disease. Uh, presently I'm working as has already been explained as, in the, as a professor in the Department of Cardiology at KDMC that is in Lucknow and uh, I happen to be on the boards of uh, some of these generals and this is our beautiful uh, university that I work in so I just really wanted to show you the picture of this beautiful university that is the King George's Medical University in Lucknow. So the point is that the heart is actually uh, is, is an organ that helps us throughout our lives and uh, the point is that every year the life expectancy is increasing and presently the life expectancy is around global life expectancy is around 71 years and the life expectancy free of diseases is around 63 years. Uh, the kind of exponential increase in the life expectancy uh, means that for all of us who cross the age certain age of 40 and 50 years chances are that we are going to live to 80 to 90 years. So in that case we should take uh, care of the organ uh, that is helping us lead a healthy life that way. So uh, we all know, we all have seen these slides that global mortality um, from cardiovascular diseases is increasing and I would keep my presentation focused on the Southeast Asian countries and the developing countries with special reference to India and try to give you all a picture of cardiovascular diseases and the status of various risk factors uh, in the context of my own country because many a times uh, in the international literature you have data from Indian and Southeast Asian countries missing which actually account for a very very large burden of overall cardiovascular mortality. So as you can see here uh, the large amount of cardiovascular mortality is coming from uh, Southeast Asian countries and the developing countries and as was being discussed earlier, non-communicable disease, a lot of programs are already in place for the communicable disease, but if you see here clearly that as we speak in 2016, up to 20% of all global mortality is happening because of cardiovascular disease, and the plan is to cut uh, this incremental growth by 2030, but if we go by the standards that we are going in 2030, 25% of all global mortality would be by cardiovascular diseases, so it becomes uh, uh, and this is just plain mortality, if you add morbidity to it, a uh, tremendous amount of economic burden is incurred on the society by cardiovascular diseases, so it becomes very, very important as for us to, uh, to deal with cardiovascular diseases and prevention is one of the strategies um, that is most important because you essentially have to prevent the disease and uh, uh, I will be speaking upon the epidemiology and the preventive aspects of uh, cardiovascular diseases. So uh, the cardiovascular diseases in terms of if we combine the risk factors and the, all these risk factors tend to contribute to cardiovascular diseases and if you try to break them into percentages in terms of attributable risk it's the high blood pressure that is accounting for most of the cardiovascular mortality as far as the risk factors is concerned up to 13 percent of global deaths can be attributed to high blood pressure and then there's tobacco use um, high sugar levels, physical inactivities, obesity and so on. Well these are the traditional four classical uh, risk factors for um, so I'm not talking too much about diabetes because diabetes itself becomes a cardiovascular disease equivalent diabetes and cardiovascular disease tend to happen in, in tend to work in, uh, in tandem to cause havoc uh, on the cardiovascular system but generally speaking, the modifiable risk factors are hypertension, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, mental stress, and all these factors um, are important. Uh, Framingham Heart Study clearly lay the foundation uh, as far as the risk factors for cardiovascular diseases were concerned. Hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and smoking were considered four pillars on which cardiovascular diseases rest. But then now we have newer risk factors coming up about which we'll be talking as we move forward. So hypertension is a global killer. We all know that up to 25% of human population, nearly 1 billion people globally are affected with hypertension. And it is generally encouraged to maintain an optimal blood pressure goal of 120 by 80 through lifestyle approaches. However, the pharmacotherapy or the drug therapy is only indicated when the blood pressure goes above 140 by 90. There has been some controversy that is coming up in the recent literature about on drug therapy, how low should you bring the 
bring the blood pressure. Uh, generally speaking, as as we speak, the modern guidelines, the present guidelines state that on drugs, our goal of bringing down the blood pressure should be 140 by 90, but there is some data evolving that in certain high-risk individuals even bring down blood pressure on drug therapy to 120 by 80 may be beneficial, but these are not the goals now. The goals right now are 140 by 90. So we actually, coming to the Indian context, we actually did this largest survey last year in 2015 uh, on one single day that was again associated, uh, again linked to the World Heart Day last year. And we did this survey spread over just eight hours. And eight hours cross-sectionally, we, we surveyed and sampled the blood pressures of more than 1.5 lakh people. And uh, within next um, month or so, we were able to analyze and do some statistics, apply some statistics on 74,000 of them. The larger data would be released this year. But this is the analysis of the 74,000 of those more than 150,000 patients that we studied. More than 100 cities, more than 700 sites private and public hospitals, and this is the largest survey till date of hypertension trends in India. And you could find out that, you know, 33% of our population, uh, globally the figures are around 25%, but 33% of the sample population, that is, was pretty strong sample, um, were hypertensive patients. So that's the data from India, that's the most authentic data from India. And the interesting point was that up to one-fourth of those patients were in the age group of 31 to 45 years of age. So these were this. So we were suffering from uh, the Indians were uh, suffering from hypertension at a relatively younger age group, and even those people who were the vast majority of them were over 40 years. We do not have any data at what point of time they became actually became hypertensive. So it is reasonable est to estimate that 25, 30 uh, percent. Uh, patients of um, hypertension start very, very young as far as as young as 30, 30 to 45 years of age. So uh, uh, the also another thing, interesting thing that was uh, discovered was that up to 62 percent of people that we surveyed were actually having high blood pressure and we meticulously actually uh, really uh, took the blood pressure with the standard procedures and if the blood pressure was higher in the first reading, the patient was allowed to sit in the relaxed environment for 10 to 15 minutes and the blood pressures were repeated and it was taken as, uh, only when the repeat value was at the same level, they were treated as hypertensives. So up to 62% of the hypertensives in the study didn't, were not aware that they were hypertensive patients. So uh, there's a large amount of paradox going on, the diagnosis. Uh, is really uh, missed many times. And even those patients who were known to be hypertensive, the only 42, only around 42% uh, around of them were not on controlled hypertension. So hypertension is a global burden. It is more so in the uh, Southeast Asian countries. And largely it is missed because of um, uh, misdiagnosis or not being diagnosed at all. And uh, also because even after diagnosis, the control of blood pressure is not achieved in a vast number of patients. So uh, coming to the tobacco use, I believe the next talk is in tobacco, so I would like to skip that, but I would just try to put on front in front of you another study. We were getting a lot of young myocardial infarctions, and we tried to find out, and those young myocardial infarctions were traditionally non-hypertensive, non-diabetics, their cholesterol were in the normal range. So we were really trying to find out what was going on. And we could attribute um, a, a marker called as high sensitivity C-reactive protein in those patients and we could prove that those patients who did not have diabetes, hypertension or dyslipidemia, uh, they had significantly higher levels of high C-reactive proteins and the only things uh, that could be related to this high level of C-reactive protein after removing the confounding factors was smoking. So tobacco actually is causing a lot of cardiovascular disease burden, especially in a non-classical kind of patients, that is the younger individuals without other uh, risk factors. Raised blood glucose, we all are aware. Uh, cholesterol coming to lipid levels, we all know that LDLs are high. High LDLs relate to cardiovascular disease. I would again uh, draw your attention to the Indian context. Uh, as compared to the Western counterparts and causation counterparts, uh, the LDL levels are nearly similar or somewhat lower in the Indian counterparts, but then we have tend to have a very high degree of triglycerides, high degree, uh, low levels of HDL and high levels of high dense LDL that is attributable, that is attributed to more cardiovascular disease burden in Southeast Asian uh, population. Coming to the emerging risk factors, 
uh, you know, we have obesity, we all know about his unhealthy diets, lack of exercise, psychological factors in terms of stress and depression. And now there's a new risk factor that is coming up in the form of obstructive sleep apnea and we have been doing some studies, very interesting studies on them. Obesity, we all know that globally at least 2.5 million people die each year as a result of being overweight or obese. And optimally, we should you know, try to keep our BMIs within the range. And when you control your blood pressure uh, so as to uh, about around 10 pounds, it reduces your blood pressure, um, uh, which is equivalent to a dose to uh, lowering the blood pressure by the use of single antihypertensive uh, uh, medication. Unhealthy diet, of course, the various diets have been studied. Traditionally speaking, Mediterranean diet is considered to be the best as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned. But yes, dry diets that are rich in high trans fat and high on free sugar. If you ask me to make a choice between, uh, between fats and free sugar, I would say that free sugar is really a bigger enemy as far as the cardiovascular disease is concerned uh, rather than the fats. So free sugar and trans fats are really to be avoided. Physical inactivity is also um, contributing to various uh, le to a various level as far as cardiovascular risk is uh, uh, concerned. Current guidelines state that moderate level of exercises uh, for up to um, for up to 20, 30 minutes for five or more days of a week, or a vigorous exercise of 20 minutes a day for three days a week, uh, should should be uh, that should be the goal of people who want to lead a healthy life with a healthy heart. And, uh, you know, even with the very developed countries, um, you see this kind of activity level is attained in 50% uh, or even much lesser of their population. So, so stress and depression are also being related uh, nowadays and linked nowadays to coronary artery disease. Uh, that, I mean, the, an inter-heart study, you know, it was a case control study where psychological stress was associated with vascular risk in all regions of the world, in both sexes and in all ethnic groups and is a various complex mechanism by which psychological stress can actually go on to affect uh, uh, cardiovascular health adversely. Now coming to the last point that is the obstructive sleep apnea. This is something uh, you know uh, we, we, we all have heard about you know, obese people who, who tend to snore. So uh, you know all obstructive sleep apnea patients would be habitual snorers but all snorers would actually not essentially be patients of obstructive sleep apnea. It's only those patients, you know, who who have this uh, cycle of uh, you know frequent awakenings because of uh, uh, and there's there's of course uh, very stringent diagnostic criteria. But those patients who have obstructive sleep apnea actually have high cardiovascular di disease, and this is one of our studies that is just population just published in circulation. That is the sleep and the STEN study, the effect of obstructive sleep apnea on cardiovascular events. It's a combined effort of uh, six uh, universities, the leaders of the Singapore National University, and uh, we uh, at KGMC are their most important partners. And we have studied these patients, around 1,600 patients, and we have also proved here that uh, of those patients with moderate to severe degrees of obstructive sleep apnea are at higher risk as far as the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity are concerned. This is the largest data of relation of obstructive sleep apnea to cardiovascular ear health. So I would like to end by saying that, uh, you know, uh, I'm cardiologist, so I'm biased, but even if you look at the overall statistics, one has to power off your life, and if you want to power off your life, you have to give power to your heart. You essentially have to take care of your heart, and for doing that, you have to take care of all these older and these conventional, conventional and these newer risk factors. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ishi Sethi. Uh, Professor Sethi is from the prestigious Department of Cardiology at King George's Medical University. He's also the organizing secretary of the 11th National Conference of Indian Society of Cardiology 2016, which will open right after this year's World Heart Day. You heard how deadly heart disease could be and positive message of hope that heart disease can be prevented. Now, let us listen to Alice Granger Gasser of World Heart Federation. What are the commitments of our governments? What's the progress on these targets? And how can we accelerate the pace at which we are saving lives from these deadly diseases? It's over to Alice Granger Gasser. Thanks very much, Mr. Ronsetto. Um, 
And thank you to the organizers for letting us speak today on this very important and very timely subject um, and celebrate uh, the upcoming World Heart Day. Um, I, a lot of my early slides, I think, here have already been covered by Dr. Sethi and his excellent presentation. Um, and so, excuse me while I get this onto the... There we go. So I'm going to be brief here. Simply my message here, as we already know from the earlier presentation, oops, is that um, CBD is a huge problem, and it doesn't just affect the rich. It, most of the people with CBD are living in low- and middle-income countries. And when they do have CBD um, and NCDs, these hit the poor people harder. Um, they kill and disable breadwinners, on whom many people depend. They're, for the poor, in most countries, there's no social protection, protection to buffer income loss. Um, the poor have less access to health care for prevention and control of NCDs and CBD, and they have a higher prevalence of risk factors, and the result of that is that they die at a much younger age, which of course just increases the economic impact. And We've already seen this um, slide of the economic impact, just to repeat it, $7 trillion a year over um, these 14 years on low and middle income countries alone. I and mean, we've really been um, hampered in our ability to deal with this crisis, this uh, health crisis and economic crisis, by the way that in the past we framed our um, we framed our ideas of the so problem and the solution. And by this, I'm talking about the Millennium Development Goals, and we see here. Those goals, there were, um, here on my screen, one, two, three health goals in the Millennium Development Goals, and not a single one had any re relationship, excuse me, to um, the reality of these pink lines, which is the burden of um, CBD, even in low-income countries. You see the, p the pink is very, really very big and very important, and in middle, lower middle-income countries, even bigger, and upper middle income countries. And so here we framed our discussion of poverty and health with something that left out one of the biggest factors, and that's um, uh, that led to health inequality. And that, of course, has been a big problem, the result being a huge imbalance between how much political will and economic resources and other kinds of resources we invested in that problem. Here we see Oops, sorry, I'm not in control of my screen here. We see here on the left, two-thirds of the mortality of the world um, caused by CBD and other NCDs, CBD half of it. And then we look at the development funding, the proportions for those same problems and how tiny they are. And that um, is the result of this poor framing. So it was identified as a problem, and the solution, the first concrete um, response to that was in 2011 when we had the UN high-level meeting on NCDs and heads of state got together and committed to doing something about it and then the World um, Health Organization um, got together with many countries to develop some concrete targets that we now talk about. So the, the NCD targets to how to overcome um, this imbalance and reduce the impact of NCDs on people and on the economy. And here is a picture of them. Um, as you see, there are um, an overarching goal of reducing mortality by 20, NCD mortality by 25% by 2025. Then the World Heart Federation's um, goal of reducing oops, uh, CBD mortality um, in the same way, and then all of the risk factors and improving health systems are other goals for how to achieve that. And this was the template for national NCD plans, which have been developed in most countries or are being developed um, and are being implemented in most countries. So that's how these big ideas um, and commitments get trickled down into concrete actions when the governments really make the plans, um, and they have. Um, so. 
that was one process. Then there were the sustainable development goals that we've been talking about here. And here we see we have one goal that's about health rather than three. But in that goal, we have a very specific target for NCD. So this, for us, is a game changer in terms of political will and the potential to resource um, interventions at the population level or the health system level to address cardiovascular disease and other NCDs. And we find there are really two ways to do it. We have to reorient our health systems, on the one hand, to prevent and treat non-communicable diseases and CBD, and also to put into place policies that are at the population level um, to reduce risk factors. Here's a picture for that first stream. And I've given, I'm not going to go over them, the particular targets in the SDGs that will help us and are relevant to um, the goal of reorienting our health systems, which up until now in developing and middle-income countries have often been very weak on treatment and um, prevention of non-communicable diseases and have focused on infectious diseases. Um, and as Rachel mentioned, we have just what's uh, happening right now in that is that the World Health Organization, in addition to our policy ask for World Heart Day, the World um, Health Organization with us as we issue our policy ask is also putting out tools and packages to help achieve these two goals, to help um, strengthen population measures uh, about salt control and um, also tools for helping improve management of primary care called the Global Heart um, uh, Package that they're, they're creating. So that's, we'll be working closely with them to promote this around the world and they will be, the Global Hearts Package in particular for strengthening care will be coming out um, at, after the launch. Um, the other stream, which of course is the one that's relevant to tobacco, is the framework convention is, is reducing risk factors and tobacco is not the only risk factor but Dr. Sethi talked about the other so I'll talk about tobacco. And tobacco as he said accounts for, for 9 to 10 percent of total CBD mortality but actually if you look at premature CBD mortality which is the mortality that has the bigger economic and human um, cost in the sense of um, killing people on whom others depend or killing people who are productive, um, then it moves up to about 17 percent. Um, so it's very important and we really can't achieve our goals of reducing CVD without um, reducing tobacco use and exposure. And we fortunately have a very good tool that all, almost all the countries of the world have committed themselves to in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, and they're working very hard to leverage the sustainable development goals, the countries who have, um, in, uh, who are part of the party to this treaty, and um, will be meeting for their um, seventh conference of the parties just in a few weeks in November in India, in Noida, to discuss um, progress in reducing tobacco control, which has been enormous, I mean in reducing tobacco consumption, around the world and how they're taking, how they are taking measures and how they can take more measures um, legally to reduce tobacco use. Um, in addition to health specific or NCD specific targets in the SDGs, um, we have other targets which are very relevant to cardiovascular disease. For example, either because like HIV, um, Fulfilling the HIV target involves developing health infrastructures which can then be leveraged to, to deliver interventions, low-cost interventions in primary care that are cost-effective for CVD. Um, and so here are some examples of, of projects where people have piloted this and have been very successful in leveraging that infrastructure. For air pollution, for example, since it's an important cause of cardiovascular disease, any um, progress reducing air pollution will also reduce CBD. Women's health is um, similar. Any, anybody who addresses women's health has to address uh, the, big, the biggest killer of women, which is cardiovascular disease, which kills a third of all women, just a third of all men. 
So for conclusion, to come to a conclusion, I want to say CVD and other NCDs are a huge barrier to human and economic development and have been neglected in the past, but now we're lucky. Um, I'm going to skip to four because we have the SDGs and the, NC SDGs and the NCD targets which provide for us an unprecedented opportunity in developing a mandate that the countries agree on to tackle CBD. Um, then back to two, we cannot reduce NCDs without substantially reducing CBD, which accounts for the greatest part of the burden of NCDs, both in human terms and economic terms. And FCTC implementation and tobacco control and health system strengthening are the two top priorities for reducing CBD, although there are many other ways to do it and ways that we can integrate into other programs to leverage them um, to, to reduce CBD. And then I just want to throw back to all the journalists here the question. You see this huge um, this huge imbalance between the attention, the political will and resources devoted to cardiovascular disease um, and those devoted to other problems which are equally or even less important, um, very often less important. And the, the, the press can help really impact political will and decisions. So how can we get the level of press attention to the CVD agenda that has been given to HIV? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was Alice Granger Gasser of the World Heart Federation. Well, the panel of experts have spoken out. Good time to open the floor for Q&As. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Let's begin the question and answer session now. I would like to ask a question first. <laughs> we have many questions pouring in. Uh, my question is uh, regarding integrated health security. While diseases have joined hands, unfortunately, different medical specialties have not. Which other medical and non-medical sectors cardiology has to partner with for improving heart care in, by way of prevention, early diagnosis, proper treatment and care. Would Dr. Rishi Sethi like to answer that? Yeah, yeah. I think cardiologists see these patients whenever, uh, when cardiologists see these patients, uh, they, it's already too late. So actually uh, the cardiologists have to involve in the education part and morally everybody is aware, uh, but still as has been talked so much, the agenda has been uh, so much focused on other areas that we have not been talking too much to our colleagues and telling them what is the overall global impact and the regional impact uh, not only as far as the mortality is concerned but also as far as the overall economic burden of the society and overall disease burden. So I think in that scenario if you want to uh, interact I think it's a, it's a journalist, the primary care physicians, it's a journalist and when you come to the speciality level, it is basically the endocrinologist who deal with the diabetes and uh, to a certain extent psychiatrists and psychologists that have to join hands together. So the primary focus of our education has to be the primary care physician, uh, the generalist who take these patients when they, when they are very early in the course of their risk factors. Uh, he has to control their blood pressure, their lifestyle and that's that's the person that these patients generally go to whenever they are in the phase of developing cardiovascular disease and they have not developed. So I think it's the generalist and the primary care physician number one, the endocrinologist, the diabetic expert number two, and I think the psychologist and psychiatrist is number three. We all have to join hands together. Thank you, Professor Rishi Sethi. Uh, participants, please keep on sending your questions using, using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Uh, we have Francis Okoye, a journalist from Nigeria, who wants to ask a question. Francis, would you like to ask your question yourself? If Francis is there.
okay, he wants to know why is there more push on diet to control diabetes, but not so much for controlling heart disease. There is a lot of emphasis placed on uh, controlling diabetes and for uh, having a good diet. Uh, I, I, I think I missed some part of it. What I understand, he wants to ask, uh, why is there more stress on diabetes uh, as compared to cardiovascular disease? Yes, and he's, he's saying that uh, there is more stress on controlling diet to avoid diabetes. But uh, there is uh, less uh, uh, stress upon avoiding heart disease also through diet perhaps. No, I think, I think uh, this whole concept of uh, diet being related too much to diabetes uh, is, is actually, you know, um, quite overstated. And, uh, you know, uh, what actually you do when you take unhealthy diet, you are actually decreasing your overall health you are increasing a lot of your um, uh, a lot of your body weight and obesity and then that obesity actually is leading to insulin resistance and that is that coupled with low production as you grow older which is mainly genetically linked uh, uh, and maybe you know there are many other etiologies so diet per se would not you know cause diabetes as a cause and effect direct but then it would lead to an overall ill health and obesity which would lead to both cardiovascular disease and diabetes and it's all a vicious cycle up and down and then it's all round so it's all bad diet leading to obesity leading to diabetes diabetes leading to you know more cardiovascular disease so everything is interlinked so there is no direct cause and effect relationship between diet and diabetes thank you uh, Martin Chivanda from Malawi News Agency wants to know that Malawi is one of the African countries which has been recently hit by cardiac arrest deaths. What is your advice to reduce such cases and how is cardiac arrest treated? So cardiac, uh, so when you are talking about cardiac arrest, it it encapsulates a lot of things what you are actually uh, most of the cardiac arrest if you say are ischemic in origin and they are acute myocardial infarction and those are severe massive acute myocardial infarctions that do not reach the hospital and before they reach the hospitals they have an arrhythmic event in terms of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation and uh, uh, and they can actually, uh, uh, you know, lose their life before they seek a primary care physician or any hospital per se. But uh, uh, this is this is the most important cause of cardiac arrest. But then cardiac arrest has so many other causes. There are there there might be there might be cardiomyopathies leading to there. There may be viral infections. There may be uh, you know myocarditis, uh, and then there may be uh, many arrhythmic etiologies of cardiac arrest. But by far, uh, I'm not sure uh, if there is any particular, um, you know, uh, factor that is leading to more uh, cardiac arrest in that particular population. But uh, overall speaking, uh, it's myocardial infarctions are the most common causes of, uh, of cardiac arrest. But if you are having a proportionately very high number of cardiac arrest uh, in individuals that you do not suspect to be uh, myocardial infarctions, then of course you have to uh, study that population in much greater detail. Thank you. Uh, participants, I'm just reminding you to keep on sending your questions using the chat function or raising your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Uh, we have a question from a journalist from Swaziland and uh, I think Rachel you should be answering this. Uh, you mentioned women in your presentation. Is there a gender dimension to heart disease? How are male, female, and transgenders, are they impacted differently by it in terms of cause and effect? Um, I don't think I mentioned women specifically, but um, in the past we have focused on women and CVD as themes for World Heart Day, um, mainly because in, in, in a lot of areas of the world it's women who are controlling diet and lifestyle. Um, this year, the launch of the CVD World Monitor, um, if you remember I talked about this data visualization tool, we are taking each of the um, WHO gap targets such as diabetes, obesity, tobacco prevalence, um, and we show a map, a global map, 
um, which gives country by country um, shows the percentage increase or decrease between two years to show the performance against the 25 by 25 target. Now that map can be filtered for gender. So in a lot of in, in a lot of the, in a lot of cases, I think there's one of them where we didn't have the gender data. So that will give its own picture. I, at the, off the top of my head, I can't tell you what that gender bias is, um, but it does clearly show for each country uh, what the gender difference is for each of those indicators. Okay, Ellis, would you like to say something? Sure, I would like to say that. Um, while it is clear that CVD affects as many women as it does men, there is a difference in how it affects them and how it is treated and how, how well they get um, treated. Because it has always been perceived as a man's disease in the past, that was a myth, um, and so it is often, it, the people themselves recognize it uh, less quickly as in many countries healthcare professionals do as well because it presents a little bit differently. So we have had, as Rachel mentioned, um, campaigns in the past to raise awareness, the Go Red um, campaign to raise awareness that women get are killed by heart disease too, it's just as important for them and that, um, that, that, that both people and health professionals need to be aware of it as a, so that they can catch it early before it's too late. Thank you. Uh, Vivian from Star FM uh, in Zimbabwe wants to know if birth control pills contribute to cardiovascular diseases. Is there a link between them? She also wants to know what are the key populations when we are talking about CBDs. Who is it that you want to answer this? Uh -huh. Dr. Sethi? Uh, Dr. Sethi, would you like to answer? Yeah. Is there I, a... I, I, missed, I, I missed the second part. I missed the second part. Can you repeat? Okay, the uh, second part is what? who are the key populations we are talking about when we talk about CBDs? The key affected populations I, is... I, the... I think there's some. Hello. Oh, the key affected populations, um, as, as far as, I mean, uh, the birth control pills are concerned, the first part, uh, you know, uh, there have been various reports um, uh, about, you know, um, about they being implicated as far as the cardiovascular, adverse cardiovascular health is concerned. Uh, there have been a mixed uh, level of literature about that and I don't think so it would be judicious for us to stay to take a stand uh, right now because it's a very complicated issue. All we can say, I just to carry the discussion forward, firstly this myth about uh, women not getting cardiovascular disease is one of the reasons, this myth is one of the reasons why actually uh, the ladies tend to suffer more, uh, uh, especially the postmenopausal women. And postmenopausal women are actually at almost the similar, um, or maybe you know, a little higher uh, chances of uh, mortality related to cardiovascular diseases because it is not picked up very early. So postmenopausal are clearly, as far as as far as the females are concerned, postmenopausal is really one subgroup that you have to take. Uh, to, um, uh, that you have to focus on. As far as the other risk fact, other high risk groups are concerned, I think uh, uh, middle aged uh, population with extensive risk factors, multiple risk factors, and you have risk scoring systems, you have Framingham risk scoring systems and various other risk scoring systems, you can actually control the risk of an individual uh, uh, and his chances of developing a cardiovascular disease over a period of 5 to 10 years or 20 years. So that is uh, how I see it. Thank you. I am again requesting participants to please keep on sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Uh, it has been said that tobacco, tobacco control will save lives not only from heart disease but several other life-threatening conditions as well. Why are governments failing to end game of tobacco? Elise, would you like to answer? Um, sure. The conference, I discussed the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and indeed um, every year they, the, the convention, these parties work together and they report on what their problems are. And so they themselves have reported why 
they have barriers to implementing the convention and the policies that they have are legally bound by their promises and by ratifying the convention. Um, and they say, uh, the top one is the tobacco industry interference. Um, tobacco industry has huge impact on policy makers by um, using many, many different tactics that we could make a whole webinar on. Um, lobbying, sponsorship, um, public relations, uh, spending huge amounts of money to influence public opinion and policy. Other um, problems are that it takes a lot of collaboration between different ministries to implement tobacco control, and it takes political will from the top, um, and good coordination between different ministries, which is a huge challenge even for well-functioning governments, because you need tobacco taxes from the finance ministry, you need the agricultural ministry to um, to stop its subsidies for tobacco growers. You need, a, you need a lot of collaboration from ministries that don't really see health as their top priority. And so one of the big focuses now on implementing tobacco control is getting on board those other ministries to understand that A, um, health is everybody's business, and B, Bad health is always a development problem and it involves more than just health and lives, it involves economies. Um, I think that that's enough. Oh, thank you. And uh, we really have to be aware of industry interference because industry interference in health policy is not only limited to tobacco control. I had recently read the news that uh, Harvard scientists were paid to put the blame on diet rather than on sugar for health problems. And uh, Dr. Rishi Sethi just mentioned that if you have to choose between sugar and fat, it is sugar you have to avoid more. Uh, so we have to be really beware of industry interference. And we do hope for stronger laws to emerge from the seventh COP to uh, FCTC, which is going to be held in India very soon. Uh, we have a journalist from India who wants to know uh, that uh, this is a scary picture of uh, cardiovascular diseases which has been painted and also governments have promised to reduce premature deaths due to heart disease by one third by 2030. Are we in a position to meet these challenges? Do we have strong health systems? And do we have enough cardiologists in smaller towns, districts, especially in countries like India and other low and middle income countries? Are we prepared to meet the challenge which the SDGs have posed? Can I just say something about surveillance and monitoring of CBD? Um, so obviously you know that we're issuing a global policy call on Thursday um, which calls on governments to strengthen health systems in terms of surveillance and monitoring of CBD. I think that the work we've done on the CBD World Monitor does show that there are gaps in data collection and obviously tracking um, whether we're going to achieve um, this 30% reduction by 2030 does depend on us having accurate, reliable data. And that's part of the reason why we've produced this tool, is to highlight where the gaps in collection are and the opportunities for improvement. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not answering the question as to whether we are actually on track, but I am saying that we need to do more to measure whether we're on track, and we're trying to do that from our end, and I, I know other organizations are doing the same. Dr. Sethi, would you also like to comment upon uh, do we have enough cardi cardiologists and uh, good enough health systems in the smaller towns and districts in, in the public health sector? Is uh, Dr. Sethi there? Okay, may maybe there is some problem. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Yes, yes. I can hear you. Oh, yeah. yes, we can yeah. hear you. Yes. So I. Uh, so, okay. So I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's the targets. As far as if you ask me, my my gut feeling as far as India is concerned, I am sorry that I'm being a pessimist, but uh, uh, it's 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 a very very difficult uh, target to achieve. Firstly, uh, as as has been mentioned earlier, there is a huge gap in data collection. We are really not, the, the last time we took our BP survey, we realized that we really did not have any data about 
uh, you know, Indian data about what percentage of our population. Uh, there were only small studies related to single centers and things like that, but we did not really have a, a very large data so as to, you know, support our health policies on. That is number one. So that data collection becomes the key to any public health uh, endeavor that we tend to uh, tend to tend to take. And secondly, as far as the, once you have the data and when you tend to like work on that data to treat and prevent those diseases, I think the health there's a lot to demand uh, as far as both uh, uh, public and private sector is concerned because mostly we are dealing with disease treatment rather than disease prevention and I think that until and unless we uh, increase the awareness and, and governments shift their policy towards less populistic measures because uh, here again, sorry to say the infectious diseases uh, and other things, I'm not saying they're not important, but then when you tend to focus on maternal mortality and infectious diseases and, and, and all these control, you tend to get more populistic votes and whenever you tend to focus on cardiovascular diseases, that's not so much, you know, in my opinion, romantic for the government to for, to chase. So I think we have to have a mindset change between disease treatment to disease prevention and that I think it's going to take a much longer time uh, to to act. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, the next question which is from a journalist uh, from Bangladesh perhaps is related to this. Uh, she says that the age of onset of heart disease is sliding down. Apart from tobacco control, what are the other ways to have a healthy heart beating in the young people. Professor Rishi Sethi perhaps will answer that. So that's, 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 a, that's the biggest challenge that we as a practicing cardiologists are facing because every year in, uh, uh, the age, the mean age is coming down now up to like, uh, I would again just go back on my, uh, my personal experience around 30 percent of our patients would be less than 40 years of age and we have had MIs um, in, uh, in patients as young as 19 years, 21 years, 23 years and we have stopped getting surprised by it because uh, it is happening with such a high level of frequency. So I think uh, uh, the most common factor that we can link to these are smoking because most of these um, and that also has been discussed earlier in, this pre in the presentations that smoking uh, apart from causing overall cardiovascular death it is affecting uh, if you calculate the younger age group then smoking becomes the most important risk factor uh, uh, for the development of cardiovascular diseases especially acute coronary syndromes and myocardial infarctions. Beyond that I mean unhealthy lifestyle, unhealthy food and um, stress, uh, type A personalities I think all these work in tandem so as to produce this cauldron of uh, you know cardiovascular ill health as far as the younger population concerned especially in uh, the third world countries. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we, come, we will now come to the end of the webinar. Thanks to Dr. Srinivas Ramaka for his important message with which we began the webinar and our sincere thanks to Rachel Shaw Dr. Rishi Sethi and Elise Ranja Gesser and also Ashok Ramsaru for being with us on this webinar. As always, we will be sharing the presentations of all the presenters along with webinar recording and audio podcast with all the participants soon after the webinar. Have a good day and bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.